count down from three and then you're good. Well, welcome back everybody. And I hope you've had a chance to get some coffee and uh, are ready for the next session, um, which um, we'll kick off now. Um, Sean Pribble is one of the uh, leading maritime legal experts um, in the US. He has literally landed back in the US from Norway, where he's been working for Guard for the last couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, and was a bit surprised to find that he wasn't able to drive around as he used to uh, in Washington, DC. But um, he now works as senior counsel for Holland and Knight and has been a frequent speaker at our conferences and is a very welcome addition today. So Sean, so soon after you arrive back in, in the US, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, good morning. And I just need to confirm that I am live. Yeah, you're live. OK, very good. Uh, if, if we can advance to the main slide. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good morning and uh, from the US. Good afternoon there in the UK. Uh, my name is Sean Pribble. As, as James mentioned, this is, I think, my third time presenting. And I've, uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, virtually uh, to talk about legal considerations and views from across the pond. Um, this is an area that has uh, been evolving for several years, and I think at, at this point it's, it's more relevant than ever. Uh, next slide, please. As James mentioned, I'm with Holland tonight. I'm, I'm here in Washington, D.C., uh, live from my basement. Most of uh, D.C., as you may know, is on lockdown. Uh, some exciting times ahead of us, though, nonetheless. Um, so Holland Knight is a, um, it's an international law firm. Most of our offices are here. I'm in the U.S. We do have offices in Mexico, Colombia, but also a small office in London. Next slide, please. So my focus, uh, with Holland and Knight is, is on the regulatory uh, piece on the uh, legal side with shipping. And that's what I'll be touching on today, a combination of the legal considerations. So looking at the practical um, applications of the law to shipping 4.0, this, this next generation of shipping that includes mass, um, and then building the, the business case. So, so how do these, these legal considerations fit into business case? Uh, the idea being that, uh, most people here are looking to see how they can um, either be involved in business or or uh, support business from the regulatory viewpoint. And then lastly, what's on the horizon? Um, what are the legal uh, considerations to consider in this emerging market? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, uh, Paying homage uh, to this conference being in London, you'll see that I've I've quoted several um, English authors in this. And uh, the first here is is to look at at what does this this new uh, sh shipping evolution mean uh, to the industry? So the next decade, we're we're likely going to see more innovation in these these ocean technologies uh, than perhaps the past 100 years combined. So we're we're looking at more digital, more standardization, collaboration with the goal of increasing efficiency and sustainability within maritime transport. And to many people that are perhaps newcomers to this, this is kind of this, this bright shiny object. They're not exactly sure what, uh, what to make of it. Um, what does the technology mean? What are masks? How do they fit into this, this um, maritime ecosystem? Uh, to that end, some developers have suggested that uh, regulators and legal barriers are um, holding back this um, innovation uh, from growing to scale. It's perhaps hampering job creation that we're missing this this major um, economic opportunity. I think in reality, uh, legal matters actually permeate every facet of mass evolution. That includes not just regulatory uh, compliance, but also uh, protecting uh, your intellectual property if you're a developer. Um, engaging in what could be novel contracts for your operations. Uh, so this will spread across the uh, transport sector at the domestic level, regional level, as well as international level. 
Next slide, please. And we, we start with, with the legal considerations at, at the international level, and these are what I think are the five most pertinent uh, conventions to consider uh, when it comes to the, the idea of reduced or no manning or no crewing on vessels. Um, and we'll just talk about the vessel piece uh, first here. So we're talking Solus, Marple, the uh, Coral Regs, uh, the MLC, and STCW. And each of these um, have the idea of, of uh, a contemplated somewhere uh, human in the loop. Um, and so we have to look at each of these conventions and understand what happens uh, to their application and compliance when we remove humans. Uh, with uh, Solus, from the legal viewpoint, we're looking at whether we can apply exemptions and equivalencies, whether or not it even applies if, if there's no quote unquote manning uh, for safe manning under STCW, uh, looking at uh, the role of the human, the, the crew, the master with, with uh, MARPOL compliance, whether that's carriage or uh, response to um, um, oil spills, um, maritime labor uh, convention obviously contemplates humans as well. But I think so far, most of these, uh, the, the most critical, I think, is the navigation rules. Um, in particular, I think two rules, which are uh, rule two, which applies to the uh, decision-making idea, uh, the, uh, the ability to maneuver in all situations. Uh, that, that's more or less this uh, seamanship principle. So, so can the, the artificial intelligence um, actually conform to this idea of engaging in uh, prudent seamanship? And the lookout rule under rule five, uh, which is this idea of as we advance and we try to put in more sensors, can a, a sensor um, on board a, a, a mass um, be the equivalent of a, a human as was potentially comp, uh, contemplated when they drafted this? Next slide, please. So from the legal viewpoint, how are we tackling these, these issues? As you may have seen it, um, from other presenters or as, as you may know, uh, for uh, the past two plus years, the, the IMO has been engaged in the regulatory scoping exercise. This is um, a, fo the uh, focus here is on terminology and uh, concepts to evaluate from a forward looking perspective what new rules may be needed to incorporate mass safely into uh, the maritime transportation system. Uh, this is a a scoping exercise that uh, is looking at issues such as remote operation, um, lookout, um, uh, decision making. The framework is goal based and we expect to get the results of this, which I understand have been completed at the next MSC 103. This has been delayed due to uh, COVID-19 as far as the actual uh, presentation. We will hear likely at um, MSC 103, which I believe is in May, uh, of right now at least, uh, we will hear on the next steps. This is not going to be the release of any new regulations. This is just going to be an idea of what they've identified over the past two years uh, based on the scope of, of what they were authorized uh, to look at. Um, and one of the recommendations very well could be uh, that if uh, the industry requires some new regulation, some new mass code, for example, we should not expect anything before 2030. So as far as timelines, just consider that that this will be a, a readout essentially of what they've uh, the uh, uh, results of their research, their discussions. We won't see any new regulations at MSC 103, but we'll get some recommendations and and some way forward on, on the next step. Next slide, please. So what are the legal considerations then for the short term? So this is just uh, uh, domestic as well as international. And I think the, the, the primary step for, for any operator is, is to first identify the, the barriers, uh, then apply some type of smart measures to them. So this could be a, a holistic, flexible approach to regulations. Um, we are also looking at, at regional solutions uh, and looking at guidelines that are being developed by member states, taking a risk-based approach. I think that what I've heard from a kind of general consensus is that, that the role of the regulator should not be a barrier to innovation. 
And that applies across the board to any of these uh, regulations, including navigational uh, regulations. So far, uh, uh, the, the operations taking place are operating under current uh, legal regimes. We're looking at uh, ways domestically in various countries to grant waivers, exceptions, exemptions. Uh, but, but you also have uh, the idea of evaluating what are these emerging roles of the remote operator um, compared to definitions that we've historically used for master um, operators, crew. Uh, one of the big considerations in the, in the short term in the United States is the application of the Jones Act, which is essentially our, our U.S. cabotage law. Um, and there are very strict requirements when it comes to where the vessel is built, how it's built, uh, the ownership structure of the vessel, and the operational uh, requirements for whatever service it's engaged in. And this applies also uh, to sectors like the offshore uh, wind industry. And we have to look um, in the short term at, at how reduced or no crewing can impact some of these, these operations and if they apply. Um, another consideration is uh, looking at, at other transport modes. So not just, I think it's, it's important to not be too myopic with, with just looking at vessels when we go forward on the legal uh, considerations. There's, the, there's lots of overlapping jurisdiction and there's, there's lots of lessons learned that, that we can gain from the aviation and the surface roadside as well. Uh, government contracts, we're going to consider, uh, there, there's going to be an increase in this, I think, especially in the US, we have a large defense sector that that's, uh, has a long-term strategy to incorporate more un, uh, manned vessels. And we have to look at, at how this, this emerging technology fits into those. But, but overall, the, uh, short term should be driven by the risk assessments of the operation. It's going to be driven by data and we need more testing data. We need to be able to build safety cases, build these, these risk assessments and, and that can only come through uh, developing data and then through uh, collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation. Next slide, please. So what does that mean in the long term when we, we look at these legal considerations? So. Uh, several suggestions are, are circulating in the industry uh, uh, that ranges from amending regulations, so that's either amending uh, the international conventions, amending domestic regulations, uh, creating a new mass code. We, we have to look at the expansion into the deep sea exploration and, and how uh, those rules and regulations are impacted by mass uh, from a, a long-term uh, legal um, approach uh, the idea of, of what is seaworthiness and due diligence when we have these highly advanced uh, technologies on ships. Um, how does that impact liability? Um, the, the other consideration in the long term are ideas such as search and rescue and the duty to respond by, by the master. How can a mass comply with that? As James mentioned, I recently came uh, to the U.S. from Guard after two years in Norway working in the insurance sector, and you'll hear more about that, I, th I think, later. But, but really, this is uh, these these vessels. Uh, when we were at Guard, we looked very closely at at how this impacts the uh, uh, certificates of entry, how these these vessels can be entered, and and how the definitions fit with these these novel concepts. One thing uh, that I'm very encouraged by is, is what's happening on the contractual side with, with BIMCO as they develop this, this new auto shipman um, uh, charter party to look at uh, uh, the management of, of unmanned vessels. I've, I've been involved in that on the, the edit side when I was with Guard. Uh, when I left, it was still in a, a draft form, but it's very encouraging to see BIMCO take this uh, seriously and try to be ahead of the curve and developing a, a management contract uh, that, that owners and operators can look to uh, to integrate these into the uh, uh, maritime transportation system. Um, I think another key uh, consideration here is, is how we need to modernize, at least in the US, the, the aids to navigation, ATONs. Uh, these are, are um, somewhat outdated. If we're going to incorporate highly advanced um, automation vessels into the American uh, waterway system. I think we need to see a, a development on, on the Aton side uh, to help support that. And from the liability piece, uh, historically, and this is still the view, the ship owner has been liable 
Uh, so we, we have to look at what happens when we remove the entire crew, for example, um, and, and how a, the liability will flow, uh, for example, when we have a, a potential incident. That will also require, from a litigation viewpoint, since we don't have precedent in this uh, space, uh, the idea of, of how to develop new evidence in this and, and new experts that can, that can go through the data and explain what the vessel's decision making was at the time. Uh, this will be, um, I think, a, a very fascinating area to look at as far as determining fault um, and acts and omissions that, that could historically trigger liability if there's a glitch in the system. Um, once again, we don't have precedent, so we, we have to look to similar technical failures. And in some cases, people are calling for strict liability. And I think it's, it's more likely that we're going to see this, this shift towards a focus on the, the product liability side. Next slide, please. So to get there, I think it's, it's important to look at this idea of, of interpretation. And, and generally speaking, especially from the coal reg side, this is a a very alive issue right now is is how to interpret uh, coal regs. Generally speaking, very high level here, there's there's two different approaches um, uh, to this interpretation of treaties based on the the Vienna uh, Convention on the Law of, of Treaties. One being a a functional approach, uh, which would be more pragmatic and progressive, which is essentially to substitute equivalence for what the treaty requires. Uh, the the other is a more a formal method. Um, and, and that looks at that, the very plain language, uh, strict interpretation of, of what was drafted, uh, but that's been suggested as being unduly mechanical and too conservative for what we need for this uh, to continue to grow. Next slide, please. So one of the issues is when we see this, this emerging practice, which, which we have with we, uh, we've seen several different uh, uh, countries that are, are now testing on the water um, in international waters, um, a mass of, of various types. Uh, the idea of as this emerges, uh, whether we're seeing any persistent objections. This is important, I think. Uh, this is one of the, the key issues that I've been looking at, especially in the United States, which, uh, to be honest, in, in my view, I, th I think that, that the U.S. is thus far um, not on the commercial side, but on the defense side, the most active and aggressive in testing internationally um, the idea of, of mass. I mean, here it's it's on the U.S. Navy side, so we, we have vessels that I'll I'll touch on later that have uh, a transited round trip uh, from the U.S. mainland to Hawaii. They've uh, transited through the Panama Canal from the Gulf of Mexico to, uh, to California. Thus far, to my knowledge, we have no state objections to the U.S. operations or elsewhere. Um, the other idea is once we see where the IMO is going to go, uh, whether there is this idea of if, if there need to be changes and amendments, uh, whether we can go through this, this um, IMO tacit approval, uh, which essentially is a, a, that a new amendment would enter into force um, unless there's a, um, a, um, objections from a specified number of uh, parties. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, so where are we going to be seeing this? So obviously um, with the Mayflower, this is relevant to the UK and the US. This is scheduled uh, to transit from the UK to the US um, entirely unmanned. Uh, and once again, this will be operating under AI, um, purportedly within compliance of, of the core regs. Uh, next slide, please. We're seeing this in Japan, next slide. And again, in the United States, this is Sea Hunter. This is the vessel that is transited. And this is the, uh, the last slide there. That is the uh, part of what was called Project Overlord. And, and this is a vessel that, uh, that operated unmanned, um, essentially uh, through AI from the Gulf of Mexico through the Panama Canal to California. Uh, next slide, please. So then one of the threshold matters we have to look at when we when we decide how do these these uh, vessels uh, fit with within the uh, coal regs, the, the issue is uh, how is a vessel defined? 
and there are specific reasons why this threshold de uh, determination must be made. Uh, so, so generally what the vessel, this is going to be defined uh, by a, the prevailing governing authority in a uh, uh, domestic jurisdiction. So in the U.S., it, it's under one U.S. Uh, code as a, a statutory definition. But internationally, this is defined in the coal regs as well. Um, really, we're talking about if, whether it's a vessel, is, is every description of watercraft used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on water. Um, the UN Convention Law of the Sea doesn't define vessel, but it does define warship, which requires a, uh, that it be under the command of an officer duly commissioned by the government of that state. Um, this is not a, a new idea um, in, in the, the context of, of putting uh, ships to sea without uh, crew. Uh, Nikola Tesla uh, presented this in 1898. Um, and uh, that was a uh, remote control boat idea. Um, in the United States, we've, we've seen determinations of what's a vessel um, in a, a very famous case here in our Supreme Court called the Lozman case, which is the middle picture, which is this houseboat uh, determined not to be a vessel. And lastly, on, on the right, you'll see this as paddleboard. The U.S. Coast Guard actually issued a, an opinion uh, stating that, that paddleboards um, are indeed uh, vessels under certain uh, circumstances. So you can see here that uh, for over uh, 100 years, this, this concept has been alive. And but over time, we've, we've seen several different variations of what this means. Certainly now there's, there's several competing ideas of, of whether to call it a vessel, vehicle system, et, et cetera. But it does matter when it comes to certain application under uh, regulation. Uh, next slide, please. And this, I think, is really going to drive this, this conversation uh, further. So here we have the sail drone uh, survey uh, vehicle. Um, they just launched this last week, which is a, a 72 foot uh, uh, vehicle. So I think when it comes to whether this is a vessel or a vehicle, we have to look at this is in the United States off of California. Uh, this, I think, changes a bit of the conversation. I've been saying this for several years. Conceivably, if if you call it a vehicle and, it, and the, the idea being that it doesn't have to comply with, with certain coal regs, at a certain size and operational uh, consideration, it's not necessarily controversial. But, at, but I think when you look at this, trying to apply uh, what the statutory definition of a vessel is and whether that needs to in fact comply with the coal regs, I think it's going to raise more conversation now. And why this matters is, if you think about it, if we get on a a path towards allowing vehicles to continue to build larger and larger, what's to say that that sail drone can't build a thousand foot um, a survey vehicle? And so size does matter here in the sense of how does this apply when it comes to the conversation of applying that threshold question of uh, what is a vessel? Uh, next slide, please. It's just something worth uh, monitoring over time. So what does this mean uh, to building your business case? Uh, next slide. I think there's, there's lots of opportunity coming in. So since last year's conference, um, as, as you likely know, we have a new president who will be inaugurated uh, tomorrow. Uh, next slide. So with this new president, I think we're, we're coming into a cautiously optimistic time in the United States uh, for investment in innovation. Uh, this is something that the most recent maritime administrator, Admiral Busby, mentioned that, that we're at this, this tipping point in the US uh, we're seeing that uh, forecast of, of the volume of U.S. freight could increase by 40 percent by, by uh, 2040. So there's likely going to be lots of opportunity here for innovation taking this holistic approach. Uh, next slide, please. So where are we seeing this already in the U.S.? Uh, fair to say that, that the U.S. is still behind Europe and the U.K. when it comes to uh, uh, collaboration and practical across the sector application of this uh, technology. But we are seeing it several places. We're seeing it with, with companies that are involved in, in naval architecture, developing a whole new uh, sections of their uh, uh, companies dedicated to unmanned surface vehicles, vessels, whatever it may be. Uh, we're seeing concepts for uh, these, these water taxis that would be unmanned. 
um, uh, short sea shipping, and we're seeing uh, uh, the SOCP Ship Operations Cooperative Program. Um, that's an industry organization. They have a new committee focused on this uh, that, that's actually been around for about two years now. And lastly, SpaceX, which is, I think, a very unique, uh, to put it likely, operational consideration with, with the launch and retrieval of their rockets. They use these, these unmanned barges that are towed out to sea. They, they put them into dynamic uh, positioning control, and then uh, they operate uh, to retrieve uh, these, these rockets when they uh, land. Uh, that is a, a highly unique issue. I can talk to, um, offline to people if, if they have questions on that. But we're seeing at least, these are all at least some indications that, that the U.S. is uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. We're also seeing this on the, the broader um, applications when it comes to marine safety and uh, uh, technology. Um, for innovation with, within the maritime transportation sector. Here we have a, there's this company, Sailplan, that uh, is developing um, highly useful um, uh, a technology that can be used on ships or uh, buoys to help um, increase efficiency with this voyage planning um, execution. So we, we do have U.S. companies that are moving uh, forward in this space. Uh, next slide, please. This is also being buttressed by, by several different strategies and executive orders uh, uh, towards this, this, the idea of, of innovation in the United States. We, uh, we have it from the uh, uh, three uh, maritime services with a new strategy that, that recently came out. The, the Chief of Naval Operations will be publishing a, um, a more formal strategy on unmanned systems in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a different um, agencies, Department of uh, Transportation here, the uh, uh, Coast Guard, um, from the White House down, are encouraging this idea of developing it. And in, in one agency has gone so far to say that, that fostering innovation and growth in artificial intelligence is the government's top priority. So for those looking to invest in the United States, look at this as an opportunity coming um, and I'm happy to talk offline with, with where I think these emerging markets are, are going. But uh, Next slide, please. And one of the uh, key considerations are these, uh, uh, these uh, for now, is that, uh, since 2007, we've, we, there has been this marine highway network, uh, which has been growing. Uh, this is the idea of, of moving cargo from shipment from uh, trucks off the road to sea. And I think you're going to see quite a bit more with, with how the U.S. Uh, takes advantage of these, these marine highway routes. Uh, next slide, please. Even the uh, Coast Guard is now getting involved as a user and a regulator. Uh, we're, we're seeing them uh, seek the uh, public comment through their request for information this year. That's, that's yet to be uh, finalized. And we're also uh, seeing their potential use of these systems. Next slide, please. So what is then on the horizon? So if, if you are looking to invest in, in operations in uh, the U.S. or if, if you're in the U.S. looking to export elsewhere, where are these emerging markets? Uh, next slide, please. So really what, what's helping support these, these emerging markets is the fact that there's no shortage now of international uh, research uh, from the legal side. You can see here these are several organizations um, that have been uh, supporting legal analysis of, of how uh, ships that are unmanned, uncrewed, reduced crew, whatever they may be, how masks can operate in the, the uh, current regulatory framework, which is encouraging. And for, uh, for the U.S. side, I was recently appointed chair of, of our new committee with, within the Maritime Law Association uh, that we are beginning work already uh, to help build up the U.S. framework on this. Next slide, please. So the, the key takeaway there is there's certainly ongoing research with this, several different um, um, agencies and academia involved in this. In the short term, we're going to see the application, I think, of, of softball. This is what the IMO has been encouraging. So what that means is, is looking at trying to find interpretations, waivers, exceptions, uh, whatever that may be, looking at codes of conduct, guidelines, roadmaps, how to build that into 
uh, uh, current operations so that they're not barriers to operations. Uh, one of the considerations there is, is the idea of, of uh, the uh, testing guidance that the IMO has promulgated. This is an important consideration. Uh, next slide, please. And you can just uh, please just uh, click all the way through here. So what's on the horizon? We're looking at the idea of, of developing safe, smart, sustainable shipping. Try to make it real so that, that the, uh, the economic um, advantages are, are relevant. Uh, whether it's hype or not, I think it's fair to say that, that this is developing now, so perhaps not hype. We do need more data, as I mentioned, and more uh, collaboration. Think broader than, uh, than just mass. So this tech, uh, these technologies can uh, possibly be used in other applications. Look at the idea, especially in the United States in this new administration, how to reduce greenhouse gases um, with, with the technology. And lastly, how to be involved with, with shaping future uh, regulatory actions or even non-regulatory actions when it comes to best practices guidance. Uh, be involved early to help shape those. And next slide. Thank you. I think I'm right at my time limit. Uh, Thank you for bearing with me uh, virtually here, and I'll be around uh, for questions at the panel session. Uh, Sean, thank you very much indeed. And um, as always, it's a pleasure to hear you talk with such authority and with such huge experience. Um, there isn't really time uh, to do uh, uh, too many questions. Um, uh, and I think we'll store them up for the um, panel session uh, so we don't uh, fall behind on timing. But one question I'll highlight is this ongoing debate, which uh, everyone um, talks about a lot is, you know, what's a vessel, what's a ship? And uh, you may be able to see that on your screen um, uh, about a, a ruling in a court case that the only type of vessel that's now counted as a ship is a personal watercraft. I'm just going to leave that one hanging there. And uh, thank you, Sean, very much. And don't go too far away because we'll be dragging you back for the panel in half an hour or so. Um, uh, the final uh, session for today um, is a subject which is on many people's lips. Um, what is going to happen in the post GPS world? Um, how are we going to navigate? Are we going to revert to doing it manually? And how do we do that in crewless ships, etc., etc.? And I can't think of a better person to talk about this uh, than um, the Secretary General of IALA, Francis Zachari, and Dr. Alan Grant, who is the uh, chairman of his uh, radio systems uh, group. Now, the only slight problem is that I can't see Francis on the line, but Alan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I don't know whether Francis is uh, on the call, but just not showing. Francis, can we hear you anywhere? I can't see you and we've been trying to get hold of you for half an hour. Um, Amanda, do you happen to know if Francis is in there anywhere? He's not, but I did just get an email from him. Um, he said he's here, so I will sort that now and see if. I say, should we, um, so Francis and I plan to do this presentation in two parts. Um, I wonder if it's best just to reverse the order, perhaps start with my more focused point on the operations of the working group and uh, bring in Francis uh, at the end. Is that be an option? No, let's do that, Alan. Uh, you'll have to guide us through the slides and Amanda, I think we'll then have to go back through the slides, but I'm sure, sure. we can make that work. Yeah, if, okay, if you... Alan, the floor is yours and um, uh, you kick off while we sort out Francis into uh, getting him into the green room. OK, thanks. Okay. Um, Amanda, if I can ask you to go to slide 13 then, please. Um, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, that's while Amanda's doing that. So we're going to talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing within IALA, looking at uh, radio navigation systems and resilient uh, positioning, navigation and timing. What I'd like to do is just touch on the comment that you had, James, of a post GPS world. I don't think we'll ever have a post GPS world. I think satellite navigation, as you'll come on to in the in the next few slides, I think we'll need and we'll always look to use the satellite navigation systems that are out there. Make it all easy.
Yeah, lovely. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just introduce the Road Navigation Services Working Group. Um, I'm fortunate enough, as, uh, as James says, to be the chairman of that group. Uh, we have around 30 attendees or so made up of uh, industry members, um, national service, uh, maritime service provider uh, organisations from uh, all around the world. And we look at all of the different aspects to do with reliable position fixing with radio navigation and, uh, and, and the impact of, of e-navigation and new technologies. So we're looking at everything to try and keep the mariner safe from the point of, of positioning, navigation, timing, resilience, reliability, integrity is one of the key elements. All of the key bits I think are important regardless of whether you are fully manned, fully autonomous, somewhere in the middle in this sort of unmanned or lightly manned uh, different terminologies that we've, we've heard already this morning. And when we touch on as we go through this, I think there's a lot of commonality with some of the cybersecurity discussions that we've been having. You know, making sure the data that you've got is right, coming from the right place that so you can act on it appropriately, is equally true whether that's a position data or the information of where you're birthing and so on. So it's all about getting the right information in the right context. Um, what Francis would have said already is that uh, IALA can't work in isolation. Obviously, we're looking predominantly at what's happening to feed information to the vessel from a, a maritime aid navigation perspective, but we've got to be mindful of how that information is used, what the requirements are and, and how to take things forward. So really, we have to work with all the different sister organisations out there so that at the end of the day, we have a harmonised and, uh, and, and system that will work together. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing I want to do is just uh, have a couple of slides looking at why resilient positioning, navigation and timing is important. And I refer to PNT as, a, as the acronym. So satellite navigation or global navigation satellite systems are the primary source of PNT today. I think that is true for, for most uh, maritime uh, operations uh, and other transport sectors as well. Yet we know that any such system is vulnerable. And I've given some examples on the slide that you can see there. Um, GLONASS, the Russian satellite navigation system in April 2014, had a period where we introduced, uh, or due to a, a human upload problem, uploading data to the satellite constellation without warning, uh, quite significant position errors 50 kilometres away, as you can see on the chart, um, for around, then going off air for around 11 hours. GPS has had a number of issues, um, 2004 and 2016. Uh, a clock offset and uh, a, a timing issue affected some timing users predominantly in the uh, the 2016 uh, issue, but some um, position users did see an issue. So some of these you know, can and, and do occur. Galileo uh, in 2019 uh, famously was off air for several days uh, because of a ground uh, uh, timing issue. And again, in December, just before, uh, before Christmas, it was off air for six hours, again to a failure. Now these, these are predominantly human error systems brought into the global constellations. They're very, very infrequent. For the vast majority of time, the GNSS constellations do a very, very good job. Um, cheap work very well. It's those situations where we lose that data and it can be lost without warning and it can be you know, quite poor in terms of its performance for quite some time. As we've seen, just going back to the GLONASS uh, plot we've got there, you know, there's no warning yet your position could be anywhere on that blue arc around the, the east coast of the UK as we measured it and there's nothing to tell you that's wrong. It's how do we get that information together in a concise and, and, and correct way to keep everybody safe so that you are actually where you know you are. Uh, next slide please. But it's not just what happens to the constellations from a point of a system being operated. We're actually providing signals. Uh, GNSS satellites provide signals in a, a quite a harsh environment. By the time the signals are being used in your receiver, they're actually very, very weak. So they're susceptible to interference, whether that's man-made or, or accidental or atmospheric, and that can affect your performance. The chart on the slide there shows the different satellite constellations with uh, GPS on the top and the different rows are, are different services. Galileo, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou and so on. And each of the columns shows the different frequencies that they provide civilian and, and other signals on. The one of interest is the column on the furthest right. That's where all the civilian CAL1 signals, so the, the, the common signals generally sit. So if you have a very narrow jamming signal or interference source on that frequency, it doesn't matter which constellation you're trying to use, you'll be affected. Now that's 
by design that allows all the different systems to be interoperable and one receiver allowing to make the benefit of having many more satellites in the sky when everything's working well but it leaves them all with a common failure and as i say that could be due to space weather the solar sun cycle it could be accidental signal interference um, examples can be uh, radiating uh, antennas um, things like that or something a bit more deliberate where someone's gone out of their way, whether that's a bored teenager with a circuit diagram they've downloaded from the internet or a state actor trying to be a bit more uh, uh, dramatic. And then we've got spoofing aspects. So just to uh, define the two, if I may, jamming effectively is, is deafening the receiver so you can't hear the data that's being sent from the satellites. Spoofing is basically shouting over that data from the satellites to tell you something false. And the two have, have different connotations, but in this case, what we're looking for is identifying that something is amiss and being able to manage it. That's the resilient PNT aspect. The first step in that process really is raising awareness. So being on events like this, but actually creating uh, recommendations and guidelines on resilient positioning, navigation and timing to spread the word. To let everybody know that GNSS in itself does have these vulnerabilities. As I say, it works very well most of the time, but we have to be ready for the period where it doesn't because the implications for that can be quite significant. Next slide, please. So how do we actually try and now move forward? Realistically, we need something that allow us to just carry on with our operation as we would want to. Should GNSS suddenly have, have a problem, one of the constellations fails, perhaps you could be okay. You might have a receiver that can use more than one. But ultimately, if you've got a number of different positional navigation and timing solutions, you can bring them together in some way to allow you to carry on if you lose one of them. And that's the aim. That's the aim of what we're trying to achieve here through what we've been terming a system of systems approach. What I want to try and do is just use this, the, the graph on the, the, the slide to talk through the concept here. Across the top row above our vessel, we've got the different navigation systems. So we have start on the top left with global, things like your satellite navigation constellations. They're up there, let's use them. We then have regional solutions. So something that is perhaps over a, a sort of continental, a, a re regional space, something like Eloran and R mode. And I'm gonna go into the technologies in a moment. Um, something that can provide services to a larger area in a more cost effective way. And then we have more local events on, and services where we're then looking perhaps at a port or a particular area in particular, um, perhaps a distance from the coastline, and there's different technologies we can apply um, in different places. The key bit here is not every technology will be applicable to every location. Some coastal geographical regions may have a better fit to suit one solution than another. So we have to have a solution that is scalable and adapts to the systems that be available in different places. That's no easy task, but there's work in, in place to try and allow that to happen. If we take the, uh, the next bit on the, the left hand side of the vessel, we've got integrity services. A little bit again back like our, our, um, our cyber security discussions earlier. You know, if you've got your antivirus that says you're okay, you've got integrity that your data is being checked and you can trust it. What we're talking about here is effectively the same from our position, navigation and timing data. I mean to being able to say, yep, I can trust that. You're not 50 kilometers away from where you think you are. You can actually trust the data that you've got and that can come in a number of different forms. We've got integrity data that comes from things like the Marine Radio Beacon Service that IALA uh, oversees and coordinates. We've got integrity from space operations such as satellite based augmentation services or integrity through potential new technologies, e-navigation services and, and others, or within the receiver, the onboard equipment itself. Things called RAIN, Receive Autonomous, Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. Again, a number of different ways of trying to bring the integrity piece together, and some may be more suitable for others. Having got all of that data going on around the ship, how do we bring it together? And that's where, where our integration system in the center of the vessel really comes into its own. And that's gonna be common regardless as you've got a, a manned vessel or, a, or autonomous vessel, we need to be able to use all of the information available in a sensible way. One that makes sense has known failure modes and known performance so that we can keep the performance levels that we desire. And we see on this, the picture here that that information is supported in this case through other shipborne information. And I mentioned uh, dead reckoning, speed, depth, but that could also be LIDAR and other sensors you'd expect to get on a, a, an autonomous vessel. And it's all for providing the, the user, whether they be on the vessel or remotely, with the right level of information to make the, the decisions they need to make as they go about their, their passage to remain safe. 
So that's the systems of systems approach, and I'm going to pick into different areas of that through the, the rest of my part of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said at the very start, GNSS and augmentation, um, I believe are going to be there, going to be a crucial part to the, the systems of system solution. The different constellations, the, the four international constellations that are up and are evolving, um, GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Beidou, uh, all in different uh, uh, evolutionary stages. You know, GPS and, uh, and GLONASS have been around for a lot longer. They're bringing in, all of them are bringing in new civilian signals, they're bringing in more data, um, some of them looking at uh, authentication options. The world is changing there for the better in the main to allow us to, to have more faith and, and understanding of the data that we're being provided. But there's a means of providing augmentation as well, something that uh, will confirm the integrity of the data and look to remove some of the error sources uh, from the signals traveling through the atmosphere. Historically, that's been through the IALA mean radio beacon system on the chart on the top right there, the green uh, uh, icons around the coastline are the existing marine radio beacon differential GPS stations. Um, so they provide augmentations. They tell you what's happening with the, uh, the errors so you can model it and you can actually then uh, get your position a bit more accurately. But they also tell you if the systems are going wrong. And there's other uh, work we've been we've been progressing over the last few years supporting the use of SBAS, space-based augmentation systems, things like EGNOS over Europe, WAS over the US, and, and others around the world. Again, you can see on the chart we've got uh, a, a plot of all the different SBAS systems that are in force or being developed, and it's moving from largely more northern hemisphere into more sort of Africa, Australia, and so on. SBAS systems are developed for aviation in the main, but they have a significant benefit to bring to the maritime user. There's some regulatory processes to catch up with and to work out, and we're supporting that through documentation and, uh, and, and guidance out of the working group. So on the GNSS and augmentation side, we've created uh, recommendations looking at GNSS vulnerabilities. So again, understanding what those vulnerabilities are and what the potential mitigations may be. We're looking at guidelines on the use and maintenance of marine radio beacons, and that includes guidance for those um, administrations that are looking to continue providing their services into the future and those that may be considering to the closure of their service, which some have. We're looking at uh, we've developed guidelines on the maritime use of SBAS, so trying to actually go out and say these are things you need to think about if we're going to try and use SBAS in a maritime context. It's not as straightforward as just considering there was aircraft uh, traveling on the, the surface of the water. It's a bit more complex than that. And then the other bit you'll see as we go through the slide, we'll talk about these S200 product specifications. For those of you that are, are, are familiar, they're a way of trying to capture existing data in a machine to machine format to support e-navigation. So when we've got uh, the, the machines in, a, in an e-navigation world, actually we get the right data in a consistent terminology. We had a discussion earlier about making sure we need to get the language right. It allows us to make sure the data again is conveyed in the correct way to get the right answer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, Alan, just to let you know, Francis is online now, ready to go when you're ready. Uh, do you want me to carry on through my bit? No, you carry on, but then yeah. I'm okay. just saying he's there waiting and we'll cut back to the first slide. OK, lovely, thank you. So if we then think of, you know, that was GNSS and, and SBAS being a little bit more sort of the global picture or, or wider regional areas. If we think more regional in terms of, of terrestrial now, um, we've got a system called ELORAN that's being uh, developed. So ELORAN is a terrestrial low frequency, high power signal with a dissimilar failure modes to GNSS. Um, some of you may be more familiar with it than others. I'm not going to go into huge detail into to ELORAN and how it works, only to say that it's a proven system. It's been demonstrated at different uh, locations around the, the world, including the UK. Um, and it's being implemented in a number of different places now. You'll see on the chart on the bottom right of that picture um, from the um, Resilient Navigation and Timing Foundation, where they're mapping the different locations where ELORAN is, is being implemented now. Um, it's capable of providing the 10 meter accuracy requirements of uh, um, the IMO uh, port and, and, hard and coastal uh, approach stage, and it can provide timing to stratum one level performance. So there's different uh, potential use cases out of the combinations of the different systems coming together. As I said before at the start, different systems will suit different geographical regions and, uh, and, and different desires. 
Within our working group, we've got uh, uh, recommendations on the performance and monitoring of eLaran. We've got guidelines on how to set up a service, a kind of go-to handbook of how to bring that forward, and also development of the S200 product specifications related to eLaran activities. So with things like um, the reference station almanacs and, uh, and, and propagation effects. Again, a way of being able to get that data in a, a suitable format to be used in receivers and, and so on. Next slide, please. Another concept that we're looking at is, is ranging mode, R mode, and this comes in in two different guises, but the, the basic premise is the addition of a timing signal to existing maritime infrastructure. So in this case, we can think of marine radio beacon differential base stations and AIS or the future VHF data exchange base stations. They have a, a particular need and a service that they're doing now, but if we take them being at known locations and we can put a timing signal on them, we can range to and from them. Do that to enough stations, we can know our position. That's the basic idea. Um, we're working within the, uh, the, the working group on a number of different documents, but we're liaising closely with international partners and, and project teams, um, particularly for our mode in this area, we're looking and working with our colleagues in the Baltic Sea. We're undertaking a, a project looking at developing uh, both the MF and the, uh, the, the AIS readers equivalent. And we're working and understanding what's happening internationally and in different uh, uh, test beds around the world. But ultimately, if you think of the, the, the MF, the 300, uh, 300 kilohertz beacon um, R mode transmissions, we have the idea of being putting two additional uh, carry wave signals either side of the existing uh, MSK legacy transmission and looking to time off of that. There's some technical questions still being resolved on that in terms of the effect of the, the atmosphere at night, the, the E layer, the sky wave effects, but that's being worked upon. And then for the, the AIS and VDES approach, they originally started looking at uh, uh, providing signals to the AIS base station network. And that was quite uh, quite quickly ruled out due to uh, um, basically not overloading the AIS capability. The VHF data exchange system is going to include AIS as a component, so it was considered a much better opportunity to consider about putting um, R mode function straight in the VDES function from the start, and that's what's being done. So within our working group, we're focusing on the MF aspects. Another one of the IALA working groups, the navigation committee, is looking at uh, uh, the, the VHF, the VDES side of, of R mode, but we're working very closely together to make things uh, actually work together. Those two systems should be interoperable. So within the working group, we've got a number of guidelines on R mode, um, looking at uh, what we can do with that. And as I say, we're working with the IALA Renavigation Committee to make sure that we're sharing information and being able to, to bring the technical development forward. Uh, next slide, please. So if we then move from kind of regional into more local, so shorter distance from the coast, another area that we've been working on and looking at uh, the results and, and liaising with, uh, with different uh, international bodies and, and partners over the last um, probably four or five years is looking at enhanced radar positioning. So if we think of a radar and a Raycon, Traditionally, they've been relative positioning solutions. The radar will tell you the relative position to where the Raycon is. What we've been looking at here and getting data back, and we're, we're now trying to look at the international, sort of not quite standardization, but the, the commonalities, uh, uh, capturing the commonalities of the design, is looking at an E-Raycon and E-Radar, where the Raycon returns its known fixed location within its radar response. The modified radar then actually then interprets that adds the known uh, range and direction or bearing to that known point, and you can then start getting an absolute position of the radar unit itself. So we've had uh, reports to the working group from a number of trials uh, going back, so probably over the last four or five, maybe a few years longer, uh, efficiencies, axes, and, and various other trials um, international. Uh, on the screen, you can see some plots from uh, a, a trial being held in Singapore Harbour. And it's all about trying to give that resilient positioning solution that's not dependent on GNSS. Now, all the different systems I've been talking about, the R mode, the ELRAM, they're all independent of GNSS, but can com be combined in that single solution towards the end. So within the working group, we've been looking at guidelines on how to actually bring the technical development of, of this uh, enhanced radar positioning together, and raising awareness of some of the technical constraints 
with, with using harbors, uh, using it, uh, Raycons, particularly in, in busy harbors when you've got lots of, of simultaneous um, um, illuminations, and really sharing the developments both internationally and, and nationally. Uh, next slide, please. But we don't stop there. There's a whole host and raft of different areas and topics that we look at. And one of the key parts, I think, you know, personally within the working group is the ability just to sit there and actually share ideas. We talk about the ideas of, of new systems, new developments, things that have changed, different regulatory changes, different uh, you know, failures of components, that sort of stuff. It's all about learning and exchanging information. It's about how we talk about the different integrity components, the different approaches that are coming up, problems that we have foreseen standards and all that aspect and how we bring that together really from the common goal of making sure that what we do fits in internationally. One of the things that have been quite uh, interesting just talking through is the example I've got on the screen here uh, called BinoNav which has been developed by the organisation I work for, the General Lighthouse Authorities, uh, how we actually now try and take that forward. So that helps us get uh, a, a bridge between the electronic world and a visual world in terms of being able to bring the blockers up and, and click your bearings and see that on the screen. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the key considerations I said really is integrity, and that's, uh, that's key for everybody, whether you're manned or not. And we need to know how that works and how we bring that together. And I think I've probably captured enough on, on the integrity in terms of, of making sure that we get all the, uh, the different bits of information in a confined way. Next slide, please. So how do we actually bring things together on the ship? And this is really a, a, a time critical and uh, interesting piece. User equipment is key for all of us, manned or unmanned. The IMO has developed a multi-system receiver uh, with some amendments and also PNT guidelines. And I show a picture of that on the, on the slide here. And that's already approved and set up to take inputs from different GNSS, different augmentation systems, different terrestrial systems. This is a system that allows this resilient PNT discussion to come together today if we actually progress it through the next stage, which is the IEC test spec development. And I think it's something that uh, is in all of our interests to be able to try and, and support and, and make that happen. So we can help move resilient PNT from what is a good theory in times into something that is actually tangible on a ship. Uh, next slide, please. So say the international standards, um, we've done the IMO aspect part of the multi-system receiver and the, uh, the data processor guidelines. It's really now a stage of taking that forward into the International Electrotechnical Commission for the test specification. And I'd be very keen to talk to anybody who has an interest in progressing that. Uh, next stage, uh, next slide, please. Um, and that's effectively just trying to wrap that all up saying that GNSS will continue to be the main source of PNT supported by different sources as appropriate for the location and, and the use uh, requirement and task at hand. Um, it will be enhanced and, and supported by future e-navigation services to bring things forward to enable the receiver and the environment to have all the data it requires and as I say the next step really is to get the support to, uh, to, to get the, the multi-system receiver to be something tangible on the shelf. Um, and the final bit there is to say that IALA isn't able to do all this on our own. We need the support of our international partners and, uh, and, and other organisations. And at that point, I think it's probably right to pass back to Francis, if you're here. Alan, thank, thank you very much indeed. I know that Francis is there. Um, Amanda, can you slide all the way back to the beginning slides, please, so that we can catch up the first 12? There he is. SecGen of IALA needs no introduction. So uh, if I can hand over to you, thank you so much for struggling to get on to the right bit of all this and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Well, uh, James, thank you very much uh, for for uh, organizing this important event again and also inviting Ayala and me to speak again. And I'm really sorry I was I was lost in one of your virtual rooms here. <laughs> I really enjoyed the whole morning morning's uh, uh, debate, so I was lost somewhere in, in, in your system. Uh, well, I was supposed to make the, the introduction here to, uh, to ILS work together with the, a, a, a real expert, Dr. Alan Grant, and you just heard him and could see that uh, the fantastic work that he is doing in the uh, Radio Navigation Service Working Group in ILA. Next slide, please. 
and uh, you, you already heard the last part of the presentation, but I will tell you a little bit about Ayala and some concerns we have in Ayala with regard to position, navigation and timing. Next slide, please. And the next again, please. So here you see the um, definition of an H2 navigation in Ayala. And this is the IALA definition. It's not necessarily the IMO or other organizations definition of an age navigation. And you can see that from the constitution article one, that we have an extremely broad definition of an, of, of an age to navigation. It uh, covers uh, uh, GPS, GLONASS, DGPS, e-navigation, VTS, and basically all the systems from shore to ship and from ship to shore. Next, please. So how do we uh, actually go around and uh, harmonize and develop all these systems that is covered by ACE navigation? Well, we do that in a quite boring way by producing papers. Uh, we produce uh, standards, recommendation, guidelines, manual and model courses. A standard is the high level document of ILA and it is uh, uh, it can be referred to directly by the IMO and other organization in international conventions and also by uh, nat nations in the maritime laws. And we have actually just seen that one of the ILA standards was directly quoted and used in a US maritime law here recently. Then we have the recommendations, which are showing people what should be done. The guidelines are giving advice on how to implement the recommendations. A manual is a much more uh, uh, detailed document giving guidance uh, for our members and model courses are used uh, to train VTS and ACE navigation people around the world. Next slide, please. All this work is, as Alan uh, also described, done by our technical committees. We have four technical committees you see here on the screen. And we like to call them the powerhouse of Ayala because they do all the important work. Um, they meet uh, two times a year uh, in the good old days where we could meet face to face. It was one week. Now we meet virtually over uh, about three to four weeks. And Alan's important working group is part of the engineering and sustainability uh, committee. Next, please. When we talk about uh, uh, position navigation and timing and future ships, the future of, of shipping last year and also maybe the year before last, uh, I showed you this picture here and these are the, uh, uh, the priorities for Ayala when we talk about the future for, for shipping. Uh, shore services, resilient position navigation and timing, data modeling and connectivity. We think that these four dots are really important for the future. Next, please. And it is clear to us that with the increased dependence on automated systems combined with a decline or maybe more a change in traditional skills, it gives us rise to concern. And we are also a bit surprised that governments and uh, authorities around the world are not really as concerned as we are uh, about uh, position navigation and timing. Next slide, please. Because on, on this slide, you can see what Alan also talked about. You can see that there are a number of alternative systems that could give us this resilient position and navigation and timing. But a major problem is that even if we take the decision today, on one of these systems, it will take many, many years before the system is actually operational. So we talk about maybe five, six or even more years if we take the decision today before a system could be uh, operational. Next slide, please. Another major challenge, as I see it, is that besides being developed, the system needs to be developed. It also needs to be harmonized uh, regionally, okay, but even uh, better uh, if it could be worldwide harmonized. Uh, to your left, you can see uh, 
a picture showing that we, we try to develop the systems. And to your right, you can actually see another system that is definitely not harmonized. And you all know how complicated it is if you travel and you need to bring all the adapters and different plugs, uh, electric plugs all around the world. And this is a really what we would like to avoid. I think Dan Hook, uh, a couple of uh, presentations ago, he talked about uh, standards for VTS data exchange, which could be a major problem for autonomous ships. And we are actually working on that. We have actually a recommendation guideline on standards for VTS data exchange. So we think that we can solve that problem in, in the future. Next slide, please. So what we experience is that there are many, many excellent test beds and projects out there in the world. We have heard some of them here today and at, at future conferences that James has organized. They are excellent projects, fantastic results, but they are all local, regional and not globally harmonized. And I think that's a major problem for, for, for the future. And we really need to, to work on that so that all the uh, best of the projects will be harmonized. Regionally is OK, but even better if it's globally harmonized. Next slide, please. And that is, for me, one of the main challenges for our international organization, organizations all around the world is to make sure that all these brilliant projects and solutions are are harmonized and used by all uh, stakeholders. And that's why we work, as Ellen explained, closely with the IMO, ITU, IEC, and other uh, major contrib contributors to the uh, autonomous uh, projects. But it's not easy, and the international organizations like the IMO and others are not very well suited to coordinate work because they are all driven by member states with different interests and uh, the meetings sometimes are half a year in between the meetings. So it's very difficult uh, to do this harmonization and coordination. You know, everybody uh, asks for coordination, but nobody wants to be coordinated. That's a big, big problem for the future and something we uh, are very concerned about in Ayala and that we will really like to contribute to the worldwide harmonization of these uh, solutions. I think that's all from me, James, and I look forward to the uh, panel discussion. And now I'm in the right virtual room, I hope. Thank you so much. Um, Francis, thank you so much. And um, Amanda, if you're listening, if you could just go to the um, master slide and we'll uh, kick off with uh, that's it. Brilliant. Um, can I say thank you, as always, um, to you, Francis, for your uh, explanation of where Ayala is and the hugely important work you're doing. Um, unfortunately, Bob Sanguinetti, who uh, is uh, um, down to chair the panel session, is doing Mortal Kombat with his laptop. And um, so in the hope that he'll come up in a moment, I'm going to uh, kick this session off. But we have a lot of people online. In fact, all our speakers are here. So um, I'm going to publish an interesting question that was passed, um, asked earlier, um, which um, I've now lost. Um, across the panelists, um, Phil Buckley says, I can see a parallel between the high seas and the World Wide Web. One person's regulation is another man's unreasonable infringement of liberty. Um, I don't know, um, uh, Ben, whether you have a view of that on the uh, cyber side. Uh, are you there, Ben? Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Can, can folks hear me? Yeah. 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 You're, you're, you're fine. Yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> yes. I guess. Um, I guess that's one of the challenges of the of the sector, isn't it? I think the analogy of the World Wide Web. Um, is probably quite uh, an interesting one, uh, quite helpful. Um, I think uh, so many people come at these things from different perspectives and uh, need and want different things from them, don't they? So when you're playing, as we were talking about earlier, across 
uh, national and international boundaries and across different sectors and subsectors um, and uh, different levels of technology, uh, different levels of uh, expectations from customers and clients, um, then uh, there's a there's a many different things that need to be considered. So um, yeah, I think I think I think regulation is part of it, as we were talking about earlier. But I think. Yeah, you've got to consider it from your own business perspective and think about the things that are important to you, uh, to your clients, your customers, um, and um, you know, think about how they want their services that you're providing, the data that you're holding or managing, um, the functions that you're providing, um, and uh, and sort of consider it from that perspective. Certainly, certainly from a cyber perspective, um, anyway. Um, Sean, do you have a comment on the uh, the link with the World Wide Web and uh, unreasonable infringement of liberties? Yes, I think we have to look at what is the to ask why do we have these these international regulations? And I think we can look. I mean, without going through a full survey of of each and every um, uh, purpose of of the establishment of of the IMO, but we look at historical context of of the idea of safe navigation. Uh, uh, for everyone on on the seas, with the uh, combined with um, ensuring free flow of of commerce or research, whatever that may be, and this goes back to the uh, times of of piracy on on the high seas, where we we had unregulated waters, and for whatever reason, and we can look at the historical development of of the IMO, nations around the world wanted to have some type of regulatory framework in place to ensure safe navigation and free flow of commerce. And I think that the idea is this is a, a, a living body in the sense that, that this is what the regulatory scope and exercise is uh, now looking at for mass. So we, we've had historical rules, regulations in place. We have an emerging technology that may or may not fit in there. That's what the RSE is going to, um, uh, they'll be announcing this at MSC 103 as, uh, with their analysis next steps. So yes, I think we have to distinguish why we have these these regulations and to look for the opportunity to operate within current regulations um, or to change them. Thank you very much. Uh, Katrina, can I hop to you and ask for your views on this subject, please? Of course. Um, I think my response is very much like Sean's. I think it's about the reason for the regulation in the first place. So from our perspective, it's about the safety aspect. And currently that's the safety of the vessel and the persons on board. So for this, it's about ensuring those regulations are for the safety of that vessel and others in, that it will encounter during its operation. So I think I have nothing further to add from what Sean has said. Um, Francis, do you have any um, input to this uh, discussion? No, I think I have nothing to add here, James. I think it has been covered very well. Thank you. OK, um, I'm going to move to a, another question that I've put in the published section. Uh, this is asking the panel to envision what an uncrewed passenger vessel might look like. Uh, such a vessel, in my opinion, would draw together all of the challenges of certification and safety, the, Bill Buckley asks, operating in a mixed economy of crewed and uncrewed vessels and navigating in controlled waters with the responsibility for safety. How does an uncrewed Costa Concordia scenario play out? Well, of course, this isn't far off the mark, because if you look at the work that uh, is under, you know, going at the moment on ferries. Uh, that's probably the first thing. Um, Dan, do you have a, a view on um, uncrewed passenger vessels? Um, yeah, great question, Phil. Um, I guess using my sort of crawl, walk, run analogy I, I put in my presentation, I, I can see some quite interesting crawl projects where I think we could learn a lot quite quickly and um, we saw in Sean's presentation a snap of a, a small river crossing system in Tennessee. I've seen three or four other sort of similar fairly small water taxi type projects kicking around and, and some of them actually make some economic sense and I think there's a safety case for them that makes sense as well. Um, a truly uncrewed passenger vessel yeah, as we start to get into sort of slightly more open water operations and things I guess there's always going to be the challenge around safety you know you do rely on crew to hand out advice keep people calm help with life jackets etc you, you can't assume everybody getting on that passenger vessel is 
completely um, able and competent to do that without crew. So I, I, the walk phase, who knows? I think that's a way away, but I'd like to see some crawl phase and small water taxi projects that we can learn from. And um, the run, the Costa Concordia scenario, the, that that's, I think with passengers are, are way off in, in my view. I, I think we can learn a lot from some other scenarios and applications first, but it, it, it talking about these things helps us all stretch our brains and, and probably helps some of the logistics and survey applications. So yeah, I'm all for, for people talking about it and thinking. I'm keen to see what the others think. Uh, well, let's go to the others. Um, um... Francis, do you have a view on this one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, James, as we have discussed many, many times, I think at, at every one of your uh, conferences here, my view is that there should always be a business case for uh, autonomous shipping. And uh, I cannot see at all a business case for a big passenger ship uh, uh, being autonomous because most of the crew, I think maybe 90% of the crew will be on board to take care of the passengers. I mean, uh, cooking, serving, <laughs> stuff like that. And the navigation part of the crew is, uh, is at no cost compared uh, to the rest of the ship and the rest of the crew. So I cannot see a business case in the near future for such a ship. And the same will be actually for, for many other ships. I mean, you have to look at the business case. Uh, a big container vessel, if you if you look at the, the price of the cargo and, and the ship and and then the price of the four or five people on board, it makes no sense because, and they are also doing a lot of work when they uh, transit with the ship. So I think we have to be, uh, we have to look at that. There should be a business case. And that's what uh, Dan also uh, showed us that it's small ships in, in short sea shipping uh, for the time being. And uh, the, likewise for, I see many talks in harbors experiment with unmanned talks, and I, I cannot really see the business case. Uh, it's extremely complicated. A talk operation is extremely complicated, and it's even more complicated without a man on board that could, could take the line and, and make it. So it's very, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to me. So we have to look at that and be practical, in, in, in the, my the view. The Spitzer you. example in your home port of Copenhagen. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Um, I, I wonder, um, before I ask Danielle if she's got a, a view on this, I wonder whether um, we, we tend to always bracket things into it's black, crude, white, uncrude. And somewhere in the middle here are some real opportunities. At one point, there was a definition that we were looking at in the Maz Red Group, which basically meant that if it was uncrude, we were actually talking about people on the bridge. We weren't talking with, um, um, in specifically in what I may call special personnel. Now, if you take all those people that make a liner or a ferry work and the people and the safety of the people on board, somewhere in there may be uh, a little bit of latitude that we'll see being explored, exploited in the next uh, few years. But I just I, I get nervous personally when we talk about it either being this or that. And in the middle is a lot of grey. Danielle, you've been sitting there quietly in the wings. Do you have a view on any of this? Um, yeah, I think you also need to sort of on the back of what Francis said, you also have to think about it from the passenger point of view. Um, there's a there's a mindset that people are in, even with cars nowadays, and that could just be one person in a car um, where people aren't comfortable uh, completely giving control away um, while they're in it. Now, if we're talking about a this run situation where you've got lots of passengers on a ship, that's a lot of people that you've got to convince on the assurance and that all these safety boxes and security boxes have been ticked for them to feel comfortable enough to put themselves in that situation. And I think that's quite a way off. I think even if we get to the point where these vessels are assured and everything is, like I said, marked as safe, I think you've still got the customer point of view, which if anything, is just as big as a, a big of a hurdle to make it financially viable to go down that route. I mean, you're ra you're raising a really interesting point about the cultural aspects of this. Mm. Um, it's it's interesting when people arrive at London Gatwick Airport, they don't think twice about the little monorail that takes them from the south to north terminal or DLR, 
Um, but of course, they know that they're on a rail, they can't really fall off. And as long as the thing can stop, then um, uh, they, they, they're quite happy to use DLR without question. Um, thank you for your views, Danielle. I, I'm going to shift the, um, uh, the emphasis to a different question. And Alan, I hope you're, you're there. Um, I think this is pretty well up your street. Do you believe that 5G will be able to deliver local and regional PNT? Alan, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I'm happy to give it a go. I, I'm not a, a particular expert in the 5G standard, but my understanding is that it will have a timing message within it. So from that, then yes, you could potentially do a, a positioning system. There's a number of other questions that I would probably ask in addition to, to whether it's possible. Um, if we're looking for resilient positioning, navigation and timing, then will it have a, a dependency on GNSS for timing? I don't know. There may well be that from the point of being able to synchronize the data packets across your 5G network. If you lose GNSS, then you could lose the, 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 uh, the timing and, and therefore you could end up having your, your resilient system uh, full fail to the, the same uh, issue as your primary. The other question I think comes to mind is, is where will the infrastructure be set up and to serve which market? If we think of the mobile phone masts and stuff today, they're set up to target the populous areas, the towns, the cities, not the coastal regions where you might have the maritime user. So I think there's a number of different questions that would need to be balanced. It's not just a, a yes and no. And there's a question I've published underneath it while, while you're talking. Has anyone started the work stream to understand how an autonomous system can make use of the marine PNT and navigation ecosystem in a way which demonstrates equivalence to SOLAS STCW compliant crewed ships? Um, I'm not sure I'm necessarily the right person to be able to answer that. That's probably well, more, I think, from a, <laughs> well, I think that's Let's probably more boss, of a, Francis. discussion. <laughs> I think it's probably more of a discussion at the sort of IMO and, and the, the, the training aspects than the resilient positioning or the hardware behind it. Um, oh, I don't know if any of our panel members from sort of experience in the Trina, IMO would be a better. Can you uh, comment on this one then, please? Yeah, you knew I was going to ask. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hang on a second and let me just get my head around this a minute. <laughs> this is all about equivalence to the instrument. Yeah. So I think for me personally, yes, I've got experience at IMO, but I think actually the sort of technical aspects of PNT and the navigation ecosystem would be one where I am going to a specialist policy lead to ask about whether they're able to provide that or whether it does demonstrate equivalence. And I guess for me, as part of our approach to these types of projects and the use of new technologies, is that actually it's is providing a safety case to provide evidence to prove that equivalence and it's very difficult to say yes or no as to whether it could demonstrate that equivalence without having that evidence and having those trials and that that conversation about a specific project so i think i wouldn't rule it out from my experience but i equally as part of a conversation if this came through on on, on my desk would be to talk to those experts in stcw and also those experts in our navigation department as well. Thanks. Um, ben, it's a bit of a, a fastball for you, but given that Netitude is part of LR, Lloyd's Register, um, do you have a view on this? Uh, obviously a cyber view you have, but separately within the, the class society M, you know, bracket of this. Do you have a view on it, Ben? Yeah, so I mean, I guess just from a security and a cyber perspective, um, you know, some of the uh, navigational protocols and uh, systems have been around for, for a long time. Um, and there are some well published uh, security issues and vulnerabilities ar around them. Um, but again, it goes back to kind of the sort of what the risk really is, because, you know, just because there's a vulnerability and a problem and something that could be manipulated, you've got to think about whether that could actually be in a place where it could have an impact and an effect. So, you know, many vessels don't just rely on a single source of information for navigation, you know, where they where they are uh, and where they need to be going. Uh, and there's often a lot of checks and balances to make sure that that information is being, you know, duplicated or backed up or got from a number of different sources to be able to do that. So um, although the risk might be there, um, you know, in many cases, um, the likelihood of something being uh, a problem can be easily mitigated through through some of those things. So, you know, think about GNS, um, uh, GPS spoofing and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think 
probably the, the key thing again from a cyber perspective is just think about those use cases think about the impact think about what this could do um, and then ensure that you know the, the right mitigations are being put in place whether that's secondary systems or other ways of validating the informational data that you've um, that you've got thank you very much um, i'm going to shift now to a new question hello michael bergman nice to um see you out there in somewhere land um, um, Michael thanks both Francis and Alan and he asks a question of Francis. Um, he fully agrees on the need for synchronization and standardization on a global basis rather than parallel development. Looking at timing and the good note on IMO, changes in SOLAS are only done every four years and the next version of that is 2024. So anything to change will be at the earliest 2028, Michael suggests. Uh, do you have any ideas how to um, beat that, overcome it, or whatever. Francis, to you, please. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's, it's a complicated issue, but I'm not sure that the solar, it will take so long time to change solars. I, I think I'm always already uh, looking at making some changes to, to solars in, in the near future, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. But if you see uh, how Ayala is working and, and other international organizations, we make uh, recommendations. And I think you have two paths there. You can either you can make it mandatory and have people to to uh, adhere to it, or you can make uh, good recommendations that uh, that people would like to follow. And I think it's maybe the last uh, uh, track that is uh, e easier and faster uh, that the uh, international organizations uh, look at best practice and then issue some good recommendations that uh, that people would like to follow rather than. Uh, being forced by mandatory uh, conventions to, to follow uh, things because that takes enormously long time. I agree with Michael Bergman. Uh, so I would really suggest to, uh, like we do in Ayala, to look at the best practice, bring people together, uh, discuss these uh, regional test beds and results, and then agree on some best practices that uh, people can follow and then do the paperwork because that's important James you need to do the uh, the, the paperwork the uh, uh, the recommendation guidelines and the uh, uh, standardization uh, that's important thank you okay um, uh, rather than push that round the panel I'm going to go to a new question uh, which has come in from John Murray Hello, John. Nice to hear you and many congratulations on your new richly deserved honour. Um, you say four years ago, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee said that early benefits would come on from marine and agriculture rather than automotive in the use of the technology. Since then, the automotive sector has invested billions, much of it augmented by governments. Where would we be now, asks John? in maritime autonomy if part of that investment had been directed to our sector. Um, Katrina, I know you're the flag state and not the government, but uh, you've been doing a lot of work through Marlab. I mean, do you have a, a quick view on this, please? Why, thank you, James. That's so kind of it's you. It's a pleasure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like actually, uh, yeah, we're an executive agency of the Department of Transport. I'm part of government. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. I think from my perspective as a, as a regulator who applied for funding that we received um, as part of the Marlab project, that massively accelerated our position in how we understand the regulation and what the barriers are. So I'm not in a position to comment on whether we should, shouldn't or could have done that investment in the sector. But I think the example I have is that where we had funding to support us, it has accelerated our position as a regulator. So I think that that's about as far as I'm comfortable in commenting or, on that point. But I think he does make a very, very valid question. Uh, Dan, um, time to draw you in with all your experience and um, having been chairman of the uh, MASG Council, etc. Uh, do you have a thought on this one? Yeah, um, and good question, John. Thanks for that. Um, I guess m money doesn't solve everything, but there's no doubt about it. Um, it, it does have a um, an, an ability to get things done and, and puts pressure on things to get things done. I think with more money flowing in, we would have seen more um, more skills, more people coming into the sector. 
I think some really well-funded projects, you know, certainly the sort of level automotive has got, but even even the tenth of what's gone into automotive would have seeded some some pretty big and ambitious projects, and that that would have attracted talent into this industry. Um, we've got lots of it, lots of it's on this call, but we need lots lots more of it. Um, I think it would have pulled people in, and I think we'd therefore be moving faster than we are. So, yeah, yeah nice thing to think about. Um, it, it it hasn't happened. But I still think as an industry, we've, we've done well without it. Um, let's hope some more comes in the next few years. Um, but I, I think it's good to see it coming from private industry. Like um, you know, Francis said, if the business cases are really there where it makes sense, ultimately that's a much more likely to succeed project than one that is um, is based on a grant and a wish and a hope. Um, so yeah, let's, let's hope more industry uh, make the business cases. Uh, Danielle, um, sitting within L3 Maths, do you do you have a, a thought on this one? Um, I think Dan put it really well. Um, if there was more money in it, it would have it would have made it a little bit more attractive. It would have brought these people in. Um, you know, like Tesla is in obviously in the automotive is painted as this very luxury. It's it's a very attractive thing to be involved in. And at the moment, we don't really have that for like the general public. We, and I think a little bit more money invested in it would have sort of raised the profile a little bit. Um, I would have got, like Dan said, got that talent in, got that interest in, and definitely would have accelerated things for sure. It's hard when you're having to sort of work off essentially R&D budgets for, for things like this. It's, it'd be nice to um, have a little bit more of a, a defined pot of money to, to work with, definitely. Seems like a powerful message to send back to the minister from the conference. Um, Sean, um, standing aside from the legal business, with all your experience of what's going on in the States, do you want to offer a quick uh, thought about this from a US perspective? Uh, yes, yes. So I think that that innovation will be at the forefront of what Congress um, in the United States will be looking at. So I think that with the new administration, as I mentioned, there there should be new opportunities. And absolutely, I think that the idea of investment in this uh, space will continue to grow. I think when we look at what's happening in the UK, uh, the EU, Norway, places like that, where you're getting um, these these results from these 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 testing the the investment in the sector i think there's there's applications in this uh, uh technology that we haven't even thought of yet uh so i think from the the business case side i think this will continue to grow uh, within uh, the us again the the business case side is not just on the potential profits uh but but the idea of of how you, this can bring in new sustainable options how it, uh, there's there's potential impact in other um, uh, reductions to greenhouse gases, things like that. So uh, that that strategy to take to uh, potential investors, the the uh, strategy to take to Congress to say, here is why we uh, we should be investing in this uh, uh, space. Here's the real benefit, and more importantly, uh, here are the examples that we're seeing across the pond that uh, we are so far behind that we need to catch up with this if we're going to remain uh, leaders with with this type of. Uh, uh, technology. So more to come in this space, but I think there's a lot of optimism here um, in the US in the next couple of years. Thanks. Um, I po published a question now, which is all about simulation training is thought to be a key resource for future remotely controlled, unmanned, uncrewed ships, especially degree three. Um, what are your thoughts for restructuring future simulation training? Is the bridge simulation training um, uh, can it replace the present sea services for future navigators and operators? Uh, Zacharyl, thanks for your question. Uh, perhaps one area that's uh, interesting there is in the whole world of dynamic positioning as we incorporate DP uh, within uh, the world of um, autonomous vessels. Uh, Dan, I suspect in your world this is quite important, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think in my presentation, I made a sort of comment about there's training and then there's sort of proving of competence and ongoing competence. Um, and certainly simulation is going to be a big part of that. It, it's great you raised that DP point, James. I think that's an excellent kind of case study of, of how we can keep our operators 
DP hours without necessarily having to always send them to C for all of them. Um, I think the word replace um, is, is maybe a bit strong for us at the moment to take that view that it's a true replace of all. I think it's a, a supplement, you know, a gradually um, sort of augment and, and eventually replace. But certainly, I mean, with our plans, um, we, 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 we've got a sort of rotation planned where our operators based in the the onshore station will still go to sea for training and competency work on a kind of cycle and I don't think we're quite ready to replace all of that with simulation not, not for a good while yet. Okay thanks Dan um, and if I may bend towards you um, initially uh, automation uh, d requires a lot of data and a lot of people are thinking a lot about data and what it means and indeed what the value of it is but if it's delivered through the cloud, as it seems it might be, maybe not uniquely, who owns that data? And um, Phil Buckley's concerned it's the server owner and therefore nearly all the data will be in the hands of very few companies who probably are not even marine in their focus. Um, this is a very interesting subject. Do you have a, a view from the work you've done, Ben? Yes, I guess I guess you know there's many sectors. Again, we can learn lessons from other industries and other parties here who have been you know using data in the cloud for a long time. Um, so ultimately, you know there will be a data owner, um, and uh, you know even if you look at some of the uh, the regulations that come out from GDPR and data protection laws in the UK and others around the world, uh, there's quite a clear understanding now of how data ownership works within these sort of um, you know, complex cycles of um, management of third parties and um, storing it and processing it and transmitting it through different networks and different systems. So, you know, the whole concept of having a data owner and a data controller uh, and people who are data processors, um, it's quite well understood now in, in those sort of frameworks. So I think we can probably take a lot of that um, and apply it to here. Um, so the data owner needs to have the control and the understanding of where that data is being used and managed and put. Um, and those data processors and controllers are then those the ones who are um, doing it on behalf of the data owner. So they should be there from a contractual, legal, operational uh, perspective. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's definitely going to be a problem area for many people as this grows. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from um, from some of the work that's been done um, in other areas. Just one final point as well on the previous question around simulation training again that's that's a really big area for cyber security as well because um you know there's, there's various universities and organizations that have been building simulation uh, uh scenarios where bridges can be built and put in place so we've done some work with the university of plymouth who have got something in place to do that um it's a fantastic way to simulate the types of events that might happen from a cyber perspective and do it in a way that is not obviously then having an operational impact um, so a lot of that simulation and um, uh, response to incidents can be can be sort of managed through that as well, which um, is definitely something we should make more use of in the future. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Francis and Alan, um, within IALA, presumably this whole data question gets a lot of discussion in the committees and in, in the general forum. Do you have a, a, a thought on that, um, Francis or Alan or both? Do we have anything, Alan? Yeah, just a thought I would have is that um, there's work going on internationally with the maritime connectivity platform that's looking at a way of trying to to link different data uh, source and providers together in an in a authenticated and, and managed way. Um, my understanding is that's less of a, a cloud in the sense of, of holding data. It's more of a case of putting two endpoints together so that people get the right data they need. I don't know if that's slightly different to the, the sort of network construct that's being considered in, in this question because my mind there is the data doesn't reside in the cloud it's it's sent straight through but um i think it's certainly one that would need to or would merit being looked at and and, uh, and considered in, in this question yeah it's a complicated thing um i'm going to uh shift now to alan cartwright's question that you should have on your screens uh which is an interesting one in uncrewed or fully autonomous ops the human element um, system designers, infrastructure engineers, etc., uh, will still remain important, and abuses of systems and hazardous incidents may well arise, just as they do in any conventional ship ops. Do the panel recognise the value of the confidential human element incident reporting program, specifically provided internationally by Chirp Maritime, 
And how do you see that interaction between the autonomous uncrewed community and Chirp Maritime to help resolve issues that arise between the maritime communities when incidents arise? Um, Katrina, could I ask you to uh, kick off with that one, please? Yeah, I think this is a really important question and, and a re really important topic to consider. So I think the first thing from our perspective, actually, regardless of whether it's going to be a fully autonomous vessel or remotely operated, there's still going to be human element to it from our perspective. And I think we already have seeing discussions at working groups and we're having discussions about that sort of the reporting, but also the incidents and, and what happens and how do we ensure the right information is available um, to identify any lessons learned. And I think part of that is ensuring that there is still the CHIRP programme, for example, um, to ensure that people can report if there are problems. So I, I think it's quite an important one and I think we do recognise the value in it. Thank you. Sean, if I hop over to you, um, do you have a view on this? I do. But we have a similar reporting requirement, so not necessarily the, the a, a confidential piece, but this is something that we've looked at very closely here in the U.S. is post-casualty requirements for reporting to the U.S. Coast Guard. There are very strict parameters. Uh, what needs to be included, to whom it's provided, and, and how quickly that information needs to be uh, provided. That can be provided by shoreside personnel, but the input usually comes from the uh, crew on board. So this is something, again, that this, this goes to the concept of operations at, at the outset. So how would it, uh, the operator be able to comply, uh, for example, with post-incident casualty reporting? Um, it's something that, that has to be factored in. It's, it's part of the analysis and, and there are potential uh, workarounds to comply. Uh, but it's it's something that you know once again we don't have precedent on this, uh, so it, this is at the uh, a very early discussion stage here in the uh, U.S. Okay, um, I'll skip to what I think will be the final question of this session, um, and I will go to each panelist. How would the panel prioritize autonomy and digitalization of shipping and decarbonization? We can surely only deliver one in the 2030 timescale. Interesting question. Um, <laughs> uh, Danielle, sorry to lumber you with um, being the first to answer, but uh, uh, surely these can happen in parallel and indeed they must. In fact, one might lead to another. Um, do you have a thought on this? Um, I definitely agree that we shouldn't sacrifice one for the other. I think we've got We've got plenty of people working on these things in parallel. I don't see why there should be any reason that we can't achieve both of them at the same time. Um, I don't think either one um, means the other can't be achieved. So I don't, I think you're right. I think in parallel is certainly doable. OK, Dan, do you have a thought um, with all the work you're doing at the minute? Um, great question, Phil. Definitely a thought provoker. Um, I, I think I'm going to say the obvious, but I suspect quite a few of the people are going to say, I mean, most of the conversations and work we're doing and procurement we're doing and engineers we recruit, those topics all seem to sort of be linking up in our discussions. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'd say it's hard for us to say I'd prioritise one or the other. They, they're really linked. Um, I mean, there are clearly some spaces where autonomy isn't in the picture. Um, I mean, I, I've actually got got a, got a hand in, a, in another small business which is doing electric propulsion systems for boats. And there's a lot of digitalisation involved in that business, but a lot less autonomy. So I, I kind of maybe um, see a stronger link between the digitalization piece and, and decarbonization and autonomy is involved in some of them. Um, maybe just as one way of sort of refining the comment, but yeah, tough. Um, my cracking on with all of them. 2030 seems a long way away some days and then um, quite close in other days. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm head down on all of them. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are linking those up. Great question. I'm going to think about that one some more, see if someone else has got a better answer than me. Um, um, uh, Francis, I wonder whether Ayala have given any thought to this at all. How are you with decarbonisation over there in Paris? 
<laughs> very, very well, James. Thank you very much. No, I, I agree with, with Daniel. I, I don't see the, the link very much. Uh, they should uh, develop in parallel. But may I just again mention that uh, a good business case is, is also very good for, for both parts. And I think what is, what is really uh, encouraging now is that sustainability is also a good business case now. It has not been that before. It was, uh, you know, rules and laws and but now sustainability is actually a good business case. And I think that's that is what will drive this uh, forward um, much faster than if you make uh, conventions and laws and so on. So I think that's good development for both sides, but they should be uh, developed parallel, of course. My own experience is that customers are actually far more interested in sustainability goals and decarbonisation, etc., than they are about autonomy. If that's <laughs> yeah. part of the deal, fine. Um, and, um, you know, come back to your business case uh, view. Um, Katrina, do you have a, a view um, from where you sit on the uh, linkage, or are you saying that one's part of the other, or they're intertwined and we shouldn't prioritise? So I think from my perspective, I think I see examples of projects where that come to me as autonomy, but have a decarbonisation element. Um, there are also those examples that actually start out as a decarbonisation project and then have autonomy tagged on as a sort of a nice to have. Um, I think they are linked. I don't think I can't prioritise them and I don't think we should. I think for us as the MCA, the fact that we have just established a maritime future technologies team that has an emissions reduction is one half and autonomy is the other half shows that for us we see that they are both important and they are both developing at pace and we need to keep up. Yes, 2030 seems a long way off. I'm personally a little bit more concerned that by 2030 my oldest will be an adult, but that's my problem. Um, so I think we can achieve stuff by then. And I don't think it can be why it will be one or the other. I think we can do both. I think, as Danielle said, there are lots of us involved. And if there's a will, there's a way, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, ben, do you have a, a thought on this one? Norrie, just to echo what everyone said, really, I think, you know, autonomy is an enabler, isn't it? It's not an end goal in itself. So we don't just go and do autonomy because that's why we do it. We, we do that to enable other things. So maybe when we're considering digitalization of shipping and the benefits that that can bring and the decarbonization goals and things like that, we may find that autonomy might enable or help or support some of those other goals um, rather than being a goal in its own right. Thanks. Alan, do you have a, a final thought on this particular point? Uh, I, I don't think I've got anything else to add. I think everybody's captured the points. I'd, I'd agree that they're two things that need to be taken forward uh, together. OK, and um, Sean over there in the bunker in uh, Washington, <laughs> any thoughts yeah. from you? Uh, no, this is actually, this is something, uh, uh, two uh, quick points. So one is, yes, the, the goal in the US is not the autonomy itself. It's, it's uh, for the other value that it adds, which is efficiency, um, increase safety, uh, things like that. Uh, second, with the idea of sustainability, this is something that I think the U.S. is is still behind Europe on, especially places like Norway. Uh, but why does it matter? I think uh, we're seeing this in uh, two places. One is uh, uh, financing, so lenders that are looking to uh, uh, to ensure that there's some type of sustainability policy um, with the uh, uh, when they lend uh, for financing, um, but also culturally. Uh, so um, attracting talent uh, to companies uh, where new applicants want to see sustainability as uh, part of the policy, uh, but also customers, as you mentioned, uh, who want to see this uh, uh, right up front as, as to how that's incorporated um, uh, to match their business plan. OK, um, I'll draw this panel to a close i think we could talk for another hour ah, we've got such experts out there that uh, it's a little uh, it's always um uh, a bit frustrating to have to uh, stop it but on the other hand uh, time marches on um can i on behalf of all of you who were out there somewhere and i'm told that up to 250 have been on at any one time um say thank you to you uh, all the speakers from this morning's session uh, sessions um it's been 
really thought provocative. Um, if I go back to the first of these conferences, we really were talking about, you know, things that were in people's heads and whatever, whatever. And now suddenly we're talking about real action that is happening. It is developing uh, in every respect, whether you're on the legal front, the regulatory front, the um, construction front, the operational front, the cyber front, um, the work that you know, companies like L3 Maps are doing. Um, there is such a step change that uh, it's it's extremely exciting to be uh, a part of this. So um, um, a virtual round of applause to all our um, uh, panelists and speakers. Thank you all very much indeed. And um, I hope you'll stay with us uh, for the next session uh, if you're able to. Now um, on the screen, you will see that uh, we are very lucky to have had very generous sponsorship from a number of organizations, uh, not least uh, BMT, Lloyd's Register, uh, Tales and BAE Systems with the great support of Maritime UK and the UK Chamber of Shipping. Can I take this opportunity today to say thank you, thank you to all of those and um, um, we'll be um, tightening up some uh, thoughts. Now I'm going to uh, pass over to Amanda who's been doing all the hard work behind the scenes, believe it or not, in Texas um, to make sure that all the presentations and the uh, microphones and what have you, what have you, have actually worked. Um, she's going to explain a little bit about the networking event that is uh, scheduled to take place at two o'clock. So Amanda, are you there to talk now? Yes, I am. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. Um, so the networking that James was speaking about um, at two o'clock, I believe, Let me just scroll back down. Yep, two o'clock. Um, it, it's what we call speed networking. Um, so it's, a, it's for an hour long. Um, it's just an opportunity to join in. And basically, when you when you press speed networking and you join the session, you're put into a, a queue um, and you're randomly paired with somebody else in that queue. Uh, you'll then be paired and brought into a Teams meeting where you and that other person can network, whether that's with your webcam or just audio over the Teams microphone um, and, and network together for five minutes. Now, you won't get kicked out after five minutes. Um, it's just a suggestion for five minutes. And once you're done networking, you just end the call or end the, the, the meeting, which uh, will be a, a, a symbol of a phone highlighted in red. End the call and then you you could go right back into the speed networking queue and randomly pair to somebody else. Um, so again, it's on your schedule. If you go back to the VCM icon, it's the left. It's an application on the left, says VCM. That's how you get to your home screen. And then on your schedules, it's, it's called networking and you could press join. Like I said, that, that starts at two. So if you try to do that now, um, you won't be paired with anybody until two o'clock hits. OK, James, thanks. Anything else? Yep. Uh, well, and uh, just to highlight that there are specific topics that are in the drop down when you get there. Exactly. That's right, isn't it? Um, I can't actually see it at the moment. I'm looking at the main screen, but um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I hope some of you will be able to uh, explore what the networking option has. Um, it's uh, extremely difficult for me to um, summarize what's gone this morning uh, and I'm not even going to attempt to do it. Uh, but if you think that we started with um, uh, the government perspective and um, uh, Robert Quartz's uh, intro um, uh, to set the scene and then we zipped off to, um, you know, the UK flag state and, you know, given that I'm told there are about 30 different nations, you all have your flag states all doing a lot of work on this. But um, uh, Katrina gave us a very interesting uh, roundup of what's uh, going on down in um, the Maritime Coast Guard Agency in Southampton in our case. Uh, to Ben, um, cyber, cyber is all about us. Um, I wonder, Ben, are you still listening to this? Can you just open your mic again briefly? Yes, hello. Hi there, Grant James. How many cyber attacks do you think have taken place since nine o'clock this morning UK time? Oh, oh I, I can't answer questions like that. Um, yeah, um, who knows? A lot, a lot. Far more than we would imagine, I guess, huh? Yeah, 
that there's people who are uh, attempting to do things all the time consistently on the on the internet so um you know if, if you had no security in place and no firewalls and things like that you would be uh, you would find yourself being attacked pretty much all the time so um yeah well we are under attack i mean it's corporate business they have headquarters with hr departments and god knows what uh, to make this all work and um you know i'm sure we probably all get the emails and the phishing and the so on and so on and so on and that's the front end of it um uh, to dan um uh, clearly o oi ocean infinity and in armada is uh, hugely progressive and um uh, you had a wonderful um, intro to what he's actually doing. Thank you for being so open with it. Um, Danielle, I thought the challenges of autonomous platforms in the maritime domain with particular reference to what's going on in the other sectors is hugely useful. We mustn't shut our eyes to lessons we can incorporate. We've got to be, in my opinion, we've got to be a little careful not to immediately assume that if it works in road or rail or whatever, it will transfer across and vice versa. But on the other hand, if we're not taking account of what's going on, I think we're probably getting it wrong. Uh, Sean, um, uh, quite apart from being a, a very senior and respected lawyer, always has an interesting um, eye view. Of course, it's been quite interesting for Sean. He spent two years living in Norway, watching his uh, nation state uh, from afar. And probably as we all do when we live overseas, getting a slightly different take on what it's uh, what what's going on there. Now he's back in the thick of it. And uh, Sean, I'm terribly grateful to you for, for doing that. And um, uh, the final slot, really, um, Alan, forgive me for calling it a post GPS world. Um, it'll never be a post GPS world, but it's a, it's a changing world in which if autonomy is, you know, we've talked about the cultural side, if autonomy, if autonomy is going to be uh, acceptable, uh, we've all got to have confidence in it. And um, a lot of people are worried about what happens if you link the cyber side with the equipment side, the technology side. What happens if these ships lose the ability to know where they are or indeed communicate? We haven't really gone into the world of machine learning and AI today, but it's all linked up. And um, uh, Francis and Alan, thank you. Um, and if Bob, you're out there, I'm sorry you got, um, you managed to blow up your laptop. I don't know what happened there, but can I thank you for volunteering at least to do the panel discussion? And uh, I hope you were able to listen to it and no doubt you'll WhatsApp me in a second to say yes or no. Um, so now um, we'll close this um, first session. Tomorrow, um, uh, we start again at 8.50. I hope it'll be less bumpy for some people getting in. Our first keynote is Sarah Kenny. By the way, that includes me. It took me a long time to uh, tame teams. Um, and we've got some really interesting um, speakers lined up with Sarah in her new role as the chairman now of Maritime UK. Uh, we've got uh, Neil uh, Tinmouth, who's the chief operating officer of Seekit International. Then we're going to go over to the Far East and um, many of you all know Dr. Quangle Lee and uh, he's going to tell us what's going on in uh, Korea and indeed wider world Asia. And sometimes we're a bit myopic in the Western world about the progress that is being made out there. Then we're going to go into defense with um, uh, the boss of a thing called Navy X in the Royal Navy and Mike Woods, the chief technologist for autonomy in BAE systems. And then uh, we'll slide across to um, systems um, as seen through the eyes of Stuart at Tullis. And then after a break, we've got uh, Britt Pickering, the claims and legal director for Ship Owners Insurance, who've been right at the front of making sure that when we're asked in this business, but aren't you going to have an, uh, an issue um, gaining insurance, she and others uh, are making it their business to make sure that we can say, yes, there is no problem. Uh, and then we're going to go and have a quick look at short sea shipping and the inland waterway stuff because we focus today on um, open waters and uh, dare I say it, the IMO regulated seas. But of course, there are miles and miles and miles of inland waterways waiting for exploitation. And um, there's a lot going on. And then finally, 
uh, we're going to end up with Tony Boylan to give us a, an eye view from the class society uh, as how they approach the whole question of mass. So I'm going to close this session now with a, a huge thank you to all of you, whoever you are, because I can't see it, um, who've actually logged on. I hope you don't have a problem getting into the networking event and um, I will be back tomorrow morning at 8.50 for part two of this conference, which as always generates so much talking and uh, useful information exchange amongst those of us in this business. So thanks very much. Amanda, do you want to uh, close us down there for, for a break and then um, you'll reopen perhaps at five to one my time. Is that OK? Sorry, yep, five, no, to no. Two. five to two, I apologise. Yep, and just as a reminder, there is there's nothing to um, reopen. Like I said, it's everyone just goes to be networking at their leisure at two o'clock and, and begins. And I'm happy to share my screen if you want me to show you exactly that. But yes. Yes, Could please. Could you do that? Yes. Of course. One second. Um, but yes, um, I'll share my screen in just one second. Um, in the meantime, like I was saying, you just go to your, your schedule on, on BCM um, and then you just press join on speed networking. It's not it's not like a group session um, okay. that, that we're waiting on everyone for. So let me I let me. Open this. I, I can't do anything with BCM at the moment because I'm looking at the shared your your shared screen. OK, let me um, I'm just going to sign in for a second. And I will show you. Can I say thank you um, again to you, Amanda, um, for stepping in? What uh, many of you will not realize is that the original producer of this conference is very ill at the moment with COVID, and I'm sure we, you'd all join me in wishing her well. And um, Amanda has uh, been through this already. So thank oh. you, Amanda, for doing what you've done. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for that. OK, let me um, I'm gonna share my screen and Bear with me on the view, so I'm going to reshare. Hopefully this helps everybody here. Let's see. OK. Uh, it's, it's loading. So. Can you see my screen, James? Is that, is that yep. clear? OK, yep. perfect. That. And so, like I said, the VCM icon, just so everybody knows, that's on the left hand side of your navigation bar on Teams. That's that's your go to. That's your home screen for everything. The schedule on the right, if you just scroll down to where it says networking event, you can access networking there by pressing join. You could press networking here or you could even just press speed networking at the top. So any of those ways work. Um, it'll also be in the center of your screen. So if I press speed networking. Oh, no, my computer's not going to be nice and slow, isn't it? <laughs> Apologies. My computer. Apologies for how slow this is being. <laughs> well, this, that is how you join if my computer wants to actually load. <laughs> so apologize. OK, well, I think you've given people a clue as to what they need to do. Exactly. And um, um, we'll leave it there. OK. Perfect. Thanks. I will be here if you have any questions. You're welcome. Cheers. See you later. OK. Bye.